So I'm going to just take us from our individual money, money stories to our collective money stories by bringing it up to the economy. The economy is where all of our stories come together. And we spent a lot of time today talking about how we learn, rethink, redesign our personal stories. And now I'm going to push you all to learn about, rethink, and redesign our collective stories in our economy. So let's get started. I don't know how many of you have heard the statement, um, it's the economy, stupid. So it's an old James Carville quip from the 1992 presidential election between Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush. So for those of you who, are, who aren't my generation, you're forgiven if you haven't heard it. Um, <laughs> so James Carville was a key Clinton advisor, and he put the statement on the back of the headquarter wall to remind everyone that the key issue in that election was the economy. So today, it's women in the economy. Why? Because women are the cornerstone of their family's economic security and we're driving our national economy. In fact, women's growing economic power is the underreported under story of the decade. Today, we're more likely to be working than ever before. We make up half of the workforce. Four out of five women in their prime working years are working, including three out of four mothers with young children. This is unprecedented. It's never happened in the US before. We're graduating from college at higher rates than men. We're starting businesses at higher rates than men. And that's especially true for women of color. And our power is growing rapidly. By the end of this decade, we'll be controlling 75% of all discretionary spending and $30 trillion of financial assets. That's a threefold increase in this decade alone. So this is all great news, right? Well, it would be if our policymakers and our political leaders really acknowledged, valued, and supported women in their economic roles as breadwinners, as caregivers, as investors. But still today, most don't. To explain why it matters, let me just give you a quick, we'll just do a quick chat about what's happening in the economy. So first, from a young age, we're all raised to believe that our prosperity is the result of our individual choices in a so-called free market economy. Well, <clears throat> I'm just gonna tell you, there is no such thing as a free market. Our economy is made up, it's a function of, it's designed by policies that determine who benefits and who doesn't. And it was never designed with women in mind. I'll give you three quick examples to make it a little more concrete. And these have come up today, so um, I'll just kind of build on what others have said. So first, let's start with the US tax code. So our tax code is hashed out in backroom deals about once a generation, sometimes a bit more. Tax policies determine whose income will be taxed and how, which expenses qualify for a deduction or a credit, and which don't. And each of these policies actually puts money back into someone's pocket. Tax policies that are most likely to benefit the most women are refundable tax credits, like the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, which you, you all know about. Um, the problem is that refundable credits make up a tiny percentage of US tax expenditures, about 3%. Is that an economy designed to work for women? Let's take another example, employer-based benefits. Labor policy and private sector practices determine who has access to health insurance, retirement savings, disability insurance, and sick leave. Um, excuse me, and 90% um, of full-time workers have access to some of these benefits. 
75% of part-time workers don't have access to any of them. So who do you think makes up the majority of part-time workers? I know I don't have to ask you guys this. <laughs> it's women. <laughs> the last example I want to share with you is Social Security. So Social Security po um, policies define what type of labor counts towards benefits when we retire. And in other countries, they give people credit for unpaid caregiving. They want to encourage and support people to care for their families. In the US, we give no credit. And again, who makes, make up the majority of unpaid caregivers in our country? It's women. So let's talk a little bit more about how this all plays out. So since our policies determine who benefits, policymakers hold outsized power. But let's face it, throughout our nation's history, the vast majority of policymakers have been men. And one could argue it doesn't matter who the, who's making the decisions as long as they take everyone's, everyone's interests into account. But with a few prominent exceptions, U.S. policymakers rarely even ask if women benefit from tax, monetary, fiscal, stimulus, and other economic policies. And as a result, we often don't. In most other advanced industrialized economies, leaders have long recognized that they need to invest in, in increasing women's access to the labor force and retaining women's worker, women workers and the skilled, um, the skilled population of women that are, that are driving their economies because it's a competitiveness issue in a global economy. They've designed and invested in public and private sector programs like childcare, paid leave, support for elders, um, They've deeply invested in enabling women to work and care for the people that they love. Here in the US, our care infrastructure is weak and fragile. Public investment in care supports have been systematically blocked or dismantled, largely due to ideal, ideological battles amongst policymakers that leave families scrambling to try to juggle work and care and they're left to do it on their own. And so the result is everyone loses. Women lose pay, benefits, promotion opportunities, and often spend down savings to care for loved ones. Families lose income and wealth. Businesses lose skilled and trained workers. And our economy loses because we have fewer workers, fewer consumer purchases, lower levels of investment, and families who are left struggling without women's income. We can and we must do better than this. So what would the economy look like if it worked for women? Over the past two years, my colleague Selena Polon and I try to get to the answer for this question by asking women themselves. As Jackie said, by really getting the insights, the wisdom, the voices, the lived experience of women themselves. We interviewed 150 female identifying individuals all over the country across race, ethnicity, age, income, parental status, disability status. We spoke, spoke to survivors formerly incarcerated people, and we asked them the same set of three questions. What have been the economic security challenges that you've faced throughout your life? What are some of your ideas about how to address those challenge, challenges? What are the solutions you envision? And third, what would the economy look like if it were actually designed to work for you? So a lot of times, women would just kind of go blank and say, no, well, no one's ever asked me that before. I've never even thought about it. So sometimes I would have to bring them back in by saying, well, what if, how would you design it for your granddaughter that you've been telling me about? 
So what we then did is we took the findings from all of these interviews and used it to design a national survey. And we got 1,200 responses from women in 49 states across urban, rural, and suburban communities. And then we disaggregated, we, we pulled out the results for different demographic groups, including party affiliation. And you know what was the most striking finding to me about what we learned, it wasn't the differences amongst women around the country, it was the similarities. What we found was women across the US share roughly the same set of economic challenges and solutions, sometimes in slightly different orders. And if you, I'll, I'll, we will have a URL at the end so you can, um, you can look, at, look at our slides to learn more about it. But what we found was that the top 10 economic challenges fell into three big buckets. So first, women are in a cash flow crisis due to no fault of their own. So their wages and their benefits are not keeping up with rising costs. That puts their household into a crisis, especially when women are primary breadwinners. Second, we found that women are paying a steep financial penalty because we as a society force them to juggle work and care on their own. So it strips women of their wealth every time they have to, they're penalized from for picking up a child at school. They have to spend down their savings because they're caring for an elder. So that adds up over women's lifetime and is a huge drain on their economic security. And finally, gender and racial discrimination are alive and well across jobs, across sectors, across managerial levels. Um, and it, it was just a theme that came up continuously in our interviews and came up loud and clear in the survey. Solutions also fell into three similar buckets. So the first is that we need to support women to manage work and care through private sector practices like flexible work schedules and the option to work remotely. Those were the top two at a time when women were being, and still are, being pushed back into the workforce. We need to provide public systems and support like national childcare and paid family leave like other countries do. We need to increase wages and access to benefits so families can cover basic household expenses, especially in inflationary times. And finally, we need to end gender and racial discrimination. Zero tolerance from the top of companies on down. So we, we know what women need, but we're still missing the political will and the private sector leadership to make it happen. And the economic costs of inaction are high. Recent Federal Reserve data shows that we're losing $1.7 trillion a year by not addressing gender gaps, just in employment and earnings alone. Other research shows that we would have five million more women in the workforce today if we offered the same suite of policies that other countries provide to, to help um, balance, women balance work and care. Um, and that means that's five million more women contributing to their household income, contributing to our national economy, help contributing to our communities, and really lifting all of us up. And the costs are, will only keep rising as our workforce ages. So as you all know, what's happening right now is baby boomers are aging, women are being pulled out of the workforce to care for them because we don't have strong care infrastructure, and that is taking a hit on families and our economy, and it will continue to do so. So let's just be clear. Women's economic prosperity is not a social issue, and it's not a women's issue, it's everybody's issue, and it's an economic imperative. For women to reach their full potential, we need to redesign our economic systems so that they, can, so that they take women's needs and priorities into account. 
So what can you all do about it? What can you walk away to think about today? So I would just, that, I'll just throw out a couple ideas. So one is, if you're a working parent, join a grassroots campaign. There are several of them going on around the country. Care can't wait. Family values at work. Moms rising. And they're bringing people together, women, families, to really advocate for stronger care infrastructure. So I, you can all come to me. I will connect you to folks in your community if, you, if, you, um, if that's something that you feel like you can do. Second, if you lead a national organization, if you lead an organization, there are networks of organizations that are helping to bring groups together to pull resources and to advocate for a gender equitable economy. If you're a funder or an investor, invest in women, invest in women's advocacy, invest in women's leadership. And if you're interested in politics, run, run for office. There's so many groups out there that will help you emerge, ignite, vote, run, lead, a lot of national ones, state and local. And if you have your hands full, I get it, I get it. We all have too much of it on our plates, then donate as much and as often as you can. And if you want to get into what John Lewis called some good trouble, then get creative. What if we all just stopped working for a day? Just didn't go to work, didn't do any housework, didn't take care of anyone. What if we just like took it away for a day to show, to help policymakers really see the economic value that we provide? Sounds kind of crazy, right? Well, actually, it's what women did in Iceland in October 1975. They called it the Women's Day Off, and 90% of Icelandic women participated. The following year, they passed the, their parliament passed a law guaranteeing equal rights for women and men. Five years later, they elected the world's first female president, and for the last 13 years, Iceland has had the smallest pay gap of any country in the world. So it's really not that crazy. So let me just close with some wise words from a mom, a grandma, and a tribal leader that I had the honor of interviewing during our research process. We need to advocate, to stand together we need to write letters, be informed, network. We need to step into our power and be positive. You can't isolate. Silent is, silence is consent. Do not be silent. Thank you very much. Wow.